Okay, so the Starlight and Shadows trilogy by Elaine Cunningham. This is a uh, fantasy series set within the Forgotten Realms series, which if you're unaware is just your sort of standard Dungeons and Dragons setting. And as such, the series is, and as such, the world is, you know, pretty generic. And whereas a lot of people tend to use that as sort of more or less of a criticism, I don't think that's the case here. The generic nature of this series really allows it to have kind of like these momentous legendary stories. Outside of Lord of the Rings, I can't think of any, any like, um, setting which has like this kind of, this grandiosity about the char characters written within it. It's, it's this, you know... Very big world full of like a lot of extreme, yeah, full of like a lot of extremes and such. And as such, a lot of the stories in it tend to have this kind of momentous kind of feel to them. If you catch my, if you if you get what I mean, kind of like that feeling you get when you read like an old poem, like that feeling you get when you read about Gilgamesh versus Tiamat or uh, Beowulf against the dragon or you know David and Goliath. That kind of thing, like that kind of epicness about this series that this like setting does exceedingly well. But in any case, I was recommended Starlight and Shadows after I said in a fantasy form that I kind of found the Dritz from the Dark Elf trilogy to be somewhat pretentious. I kind of don't really like the character all that much. And somebody recommended this as something that is similar, but different. And I do have to say it is exceedingly similar. Basically it's uh, both stories basically have the same theme. If angels can fall, demons can rise. Uh, you know, just because you were born in a bad place and what is essentially what is metaphorically hell. <laughs> that doesn't mean you can't change your ways and become a better person. And the entire series fundamentally is about our main protagonist Lane Robanry and her struggles and her adventures and struggles to become a person that is well widely rejected by the drow which if you've ever seen anything to do with Dungeons and Dragons is kind of a good thing the drow are kind of the most evil of evil people guess not <laughs> but yeah as far as the main protagonists go I find her story and her struggles to be a lot more, um, I don't want to say realistic, but true than Dritz's, than Dritz's story, because there tends to be this sort of antagonistic relationship we have, we constantly see in fantasy settings in particular, but in media in general, between intelligence and morality, they're seen as separate spheres and sometimes antagonistic ones. You consistently see this with like sim with the common occurrence. I, I think Tropic Thunder put it this way: "Don't go full retard." Never go full retard. That's a caricature of some very well-known movies and such about how about how we tend to associate people who are simple-minded with people who as being moral and people who are intelligent as being less more moral. Fundamentally, there tends to be that kind of dichotomy. But our main protagonist here is implied to be an incredibly intelligent and incredibly curious person. You know, if curiosity killed the cat, it saved the drow. Our main character, Leonorl, is very smart, and she comes across that that way. And that is the thing that fundamentally leads her to reject her corrupt society. She realizes what's wrong, wrong after seeing other worlds, after experiencing other things and seeing the wor world outside she she comes to the rational conclusion that the way the drow have been doing things is wrong and the sad realization that you can't really ever go back from not knowing that i liken it to how north korean defectors feel about the united states you you will never find a more pro-america person than somebody who lived in north korea and then got a u.s citizenship and she's helped along this journey by our supporting cast of her mentor, whose name I kind of forgot, forgot and couldn't pronounce anyway, who is implied to be somewhat similar to her in this regard. He's a wizard in uh, the very female-dominated drow society, which they're kind of treated like second-class citizens, but wizards a bit above, above that, so... Okay, they're second class, but at least they're not third class. But the sense you always get from him is that he's like... He's kind of a neutral person put into a... 
He's a fundamentally kind of neutral person put into to a really bad society. So he's complicit in the bad acts that happen in the society, but he never really seems to participate th in them himself. I think at one point in the story he mentions, I've actually never even killed anyone. But anyway, his mentorship and what amounts to friendship and what amounts to what passes for friendship with our main character gives her kind of the tools to go out into the world. He might not be able to get out of this corrupt society, but he can kind of help her get out. And when she's out there, she's helped along by the, um, I guess you could call him the secondary protagonist of the series, Floyd, who is, he's very much kind of your honorable barbarian type. That's not to say that anything about him is boring. He's like, you know, I'd say his characterization is simple, but that doesn't make him boring, if that makes any sort of sense. And a lot of, in a lot of ways, he ends up being what you would consider more or less the um, moral center of the story. This is, you know, as being like the stalwart, heroic type kind of person. He ends up be, being like, oh, yeah, this is the right thing to do, and this is wrong, the wrong thing. And then, you know, that whole ordeal. And once the first book is over, our duo here end up finding a pirate captain who will take them where they need to be. Pirates being the only people who will really want to be associated with Drow. They have a very well-deserved reputation for be being deceitful. And the pirate ship is captained by a guy named Horloff? Horloff? Whatever. I'm not great at pronouncing these names. But he ends up becoming somewhat of like a paternal figure to our main character. The Drow society is fundamentally matriarchal. So, so she lacked, a, you know, a paternal figure. Uh, so she lacked a... Um, patriarchal figure if you catch my drift being someone who guides and cares and you know will let person will let their our main our main character you know fail when necessary but help them out whenever but help them out you know like the, the standard father type type figure and i i don't know how much you want to get really into, into spoilers here but Part of our main character's journey is that a lot of the people she's going to have to meet in this wor world end up dying. That is in part because of the harshness of her past, but it's mostly to, sh but a lot of it is to show that she really has changed as a person. Um, it's not just the connection to the up, the outside world that is making, that made our um, protagonist here never want to go back to the Underdark. It is. It's that her travels and her adventures have fundamentally changed what she, consi she considers about the society. Even though she was never somebody who, who didn't fit in in her culture, she was somebody, she fit in rather well, but she now realizes that it's a facade and she can't go back. So killing the character, so killing at least a few of the characters that, that our protagonist has come has come to connect with is important because it is important because it shows that it's not that it's not just this temporary thing. It is a permanent change. So the story ends up being pretty satisfying overall. Even if I think the third book is probably the weakest of this trilogy, I would say that it's pretty good. Now, one other random world-building element that comes to mind when I was thinking about this is I love the fact that the drow end up having a good god. Right, so her entire sphere, like, ends up being caught up with the, the idea of dancing and everything. And I just love the idea that a god of freedom is also a god of dancing, which always has had this very much of a, well, you've all seen Footloose, or if you haven't, you at least know about it from reputation. This idea of individuality and expression expression commonly seen through dance thing or anything sort of fundamentally artistic which is kind of an anathema to the very totalitarian nature of the drow culture i also like that they're drawing upon multiple mytho mythologies from that um if you're unaware of the this the one of the chinese gods it's more of a culture hero type thing that's associated with the moon is is a god named changa and I'm actually pretty sure I'm pronouncing that one correctly. And she's and she's well known for being for dancing on the moon, for being a, you know dancing on the moon. I don't know. I, I thought that was like a cool thing to draw draw inspiration from. And you know I think it's one of the advantages I've seen from the Dungeons and Dragons world. It draws inspiration from many different things. Yeah. In summary, I, I would recommend this series if you'd like a generic kind of fantasy story about a person from a corrupt society becoming a good person. 
If that sounds like something in your wheelhouse, I'd recommend it. What is better, to be born good or to overcome your evil nature through great effort?